Thanks so much uh, and a big welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's session. I'm really pleased here to be here moderating uh, this conversation on how to ensure the continuity of protection during humanitarian coordination transitions. Uh, my name is Kaylin Briggs. I'm the head of interagency coordination and protection policy with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, and we have a really excellent lineup of, of speakers today. Uh, but before we turn to them, I just want to spend a couple minutes unpacking what it is we're talking about. What is a humanitarian coordination transition? Uh, many of you on, on the call will be familiar with cluster deactivation. So this is the, the formal closure of a cluster that's been activated, uh, that had previously been activated under the Interagency Standing Committee. Uh, a cluster transition is uh, the process of either the transfer of a cluster's uh, core function to other structures or the phasing out of those uh, functions leading to a deactivation. Uh, so that's what this looks like on paper. In practice, uh, we know that the reality uh, is that cluster uh, transitions and deactivations can take many forms. Uh, it can be a deactivation or a transition of the entire humanitarian coordination architecture uh, or of just the protection cluster. It can likewise be a transition from a cluster or sector-based architecture to a more area-based form of coordination. Uh, it can likewise involve a, a shift from a, a humanitarian orientation to more of a development or a solutions orientation, or a shift from a heavily international response to one that is more nationally and locally led, um, and a variety of, uh, of, of transitions in between. Um, we've seen also some transitions that have occurred in a very short uh, timeline and others that are more gradual and, and really occur over a longer period of time. And if all of this is not already complex enough, uh, we've seen that there can also be many different drivers uh, of transitions and different types of contexts where transitions may occur. Um, in the ideal scenario, a, a transition is initiated because the situation has improved um, or because the national and local capacities are sufficient to be able to manage the response on their own. But we know that there are also contexts where transitions and deactivations may occur for other reasons, um, whether that's because of a reduction in the available humanitarian funding or for political reasons that um, might be broadly outside of the control of the humanitarian system. Uh, we also know that there are ongoing conversations about um, whether we should, as a system, proactively initiate uh, humanitarian coordination transitions as a way to help reorient uh, the international response, a way to, to force us, for lack of a better word, uh, to shift from a primarily humanitarian posture uh, to a more development or solutions-oriented posture if that shift hasn't already occurred organically. Uh, but what we see is that across all of these different types of uh, typologies, across all of these different drivers of transitions and deactivations, there is a common denominator, which is that all clusters are inherently time bound and are em eventually meant to phase out. Uh, and what this means is that all of us that are working in a context that uh, is currently characterized by a clusterized response should be preparing uh, for an eventual transition and deactivation. And to help all of us prepare for that eventuality, um, we think it's important to learn wherever we can from, from past transitions and deactivations, as well as from contexts that are currently um, embarking on, uh, on steps that would enable a transition to be successful in the future, even if a transition or a de deactivation is not uh, currently on the horizon. Um, what we've seen is that in many of the contexts that have gone through these processes already, there are still residual protection issues that will remain, whether that's specific population groups that continue to face marginalization and exclusion, um, or other uh, specific protection risks and needs uh, that there may be concerns about uh, how they will be addressed post-transition. Uh, post um, so with this context in mind, it's really important then that all of us uh, and that clusters have a plan for, for how we are going to ensure the continuity of protection, how we're going to continue um, to address uh, protection risks and needs after a cluster is deactivated. Luckily, we know that there's normally important protection capacities that remain even after cluster transition and deactivation processes. There's government actors, national and local actors who were doing this work uh, even before the cluster arrived and will continue doing it after. 
Uh, we know that uh, there are often also international actors that may remain on the ground, particularly those that are dual mandated with both humanitarian development uh, or human rights and peace building functions. And so uh, humanitarian coordination uh, transition or deactivation doesn't mean by any means that the protection response will cease. It just means it will take a different form from, from what it did previously. So recognizing uh, the, the complexities involved with these types of, of shifts, how do we ensure that there is uh, some type of continuity of uh, protection during a coordination transition or following a cluster deactivation? This is what we're really going to be looking at today. Um, and we're going to, to hear from experts that have contributed at different stages uh, of these processes, different forms of transitions, in the hopes that that will support all of you to think about what this could look like in your context. Um, eventually, we also hope to capture some of these learnings in some type of practice note. And so this is going to be, uh, I think, a, a useful conversation uh, for us, for the Global Protection Cluster as well, to continue to, to capture all of, um, all of your very important experiences and reflections on, on these types of contexts. So let me now turn to our very esteemed panelists, um, all of whom who have been either involved uh, with a, a transition or who I think have useful answers to different pieces of this puzzle. Um, so let me first introduce uh, Matthew Krostek, uh, who is the INGO Forum Director in Libya uh, and who has been involved in multiple coordination transitions in that context. Uh, so really pleased to have you, Matthew. Uh, we have Tulu Masori, who's the protection cluster, or who was the protection cluster coordinator, senior protection cluster coordinator in Iraq during the cluster transition and deactivation there. Welcome, Tulu. We have Christophe Reltian, uh, who is was ECHO's uh, head of delegation in Iraq during the cluster transition and is the current ECHO head of office in South Sudan. Uh, we have Sasha Galkin, president of R2P, Right to Protection a national NGO working in Ukraine and co-lead of the Ukraine Protection Cluster. And finally, Reina Bermudez, chief of the Center uh, for Crisis, Conflict and Humanitarian Protection at the Philippines Commission on Human Rights. Welcome, Reina. With that, let me turn first to Matthew. Uh, Matthew, you were the director of the INGO Forum in Libya during the full cl cluster deactivation at the end of, of 2022, and I've also seen various evolutions in the in the coordination architecture since then. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about these transition processes in general, if and how protection was addressed as part of them and, and the role that the NGO Forum played uh, in these different conversations? Over to you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Kaylin, and, and thank you for organizing this panel on such an important issue. Uh, the INGO Forum, for those of you not familiar, is a forum of 30 humanitarian developments and peacebuilding INGOs uh, working in Libya. Uh, protection, especially for non-Libyans, is a major focus of INGOs and the UN alike in Libya. Um, so it currently seems that Libya is undergoing a transition from humanitarian context to development and peace building, which has changed how INGOs and UN uh, coordinate our response, especially around protection. Uh, in the recent past, there's been a shift um, in how specifically the protection coordination is done. So prior to 2023, there was a typical humanitarian coordination structure, including a protection cluster. Um, but in the fall of 2022, the UN presented their blueprint for the nexus transition. So this transition from humanitarian to development and peace building, uh, which would end up closing the clusters, including the protection cluster, um, and create a new nexus structure. Uh, there would be two primary groups with in this new structure for INGOs to engage and coordinate with their UN counterparts. Um, and that would be based on what's called the UN Sustainable Development Cooperative Framework. I know it's a mouthful, so they always call it UNSDCF. Um, and that was an agreement between the UN and the Libyan uh, authorities around how this kind of nexus transition should occur. Now, those two primary groups uh, for INGOs and UN to coordinate are one, uh, in internally displaced and durable solutions, basically for any kind of coordination related to Libyans, and then two, uh, migration management, basically for anyone who's, who's not Libyan. So my understanding of that kind of approach and the idea for, for the nexus transition was to have protection kind of integrated throughout this new structure. So instead of having one place for that coordination to happen, it would sort of those responsibilities that typically happen in a, a protection cluster sort of dispersed amongst uh, the, the transition structure. 
Um, however, we at the time heard from the INGOs that there was a uh, continued need for protection coordination, uh, single body, where, where uh, protection actors could really get together and discuss uh, the issues at hand. So with the, the former protection cluster co-chairs, which was DRC and UNHCR at the time, we pushed for the continuation of some kind of protection coordination. Um, one, one way we did this was, well, actually DRC did this, um, along with other INGOs working on protection, was they held a protection-focused event at the end of 2022, which included donors and UN agencies, uh, to really emphasize the importance of protection and the need for continued coordination. Um, and during that event, uh, it was stated that Libya had a protection crisis. So clearly the, the INGOs and some of the UN agencies uh, felt that uh, continued coordination around protection was, was very much needed. Um, the primary reason for that kind of continued coordination in Libya is really one needing a dedicated and safe space for sensitive discussions around protection um, between the UN and, and INGOs that, that wasn't open to anyone. Uh, and then also to have conversations specifically around refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers, uh, which is sort of the, the largest protection need in, in Libya. So in kind of response to that call for a continued protection coordination group, uh, what was called the Pro Transition Protection Group uh, was established within the official nexus coordination structure. Uh, but a couple of important points on this group is it was supposed to end by March of that year. So it only had really a three month sort of uh, life cycle. Um, and then its purpose was to, or my understanding of its purpose and, and our understanding is kind of the, the ones organizing this group uh, was to recommend how the protection coordination could fit within the new structure. So basically, again, like I mentioned, how do you take a protection coordination sort of group and break up its responsibilities to fit within the new structure? So there isn't like a single place, but there's aspects of the different uh, groups and, and working groups that really uh, can kind of take uh, replace that that um, that coordination. So through those conversations, um, we really found that the the INGOs and UN agencies felt that there was again a, a need for a space for continued protection coordination. Uh, we even did a survey um, of of the group members, UN agencies and INGOs, um, and 90%, around 90% of whom uh, took that survey, agreed that a dedicated space for protection coordination was still needed, regardless of kind of what the structure was going to look like. Um, so in response, again, uh, the, the, the UN set up what was called a protection cell. So we went from a protection cluster to this temporary protection group to now a protection cell. Um, and that was really set up more towards the second half of 2023. So what that group was tasked to do, in addition to kind of providing this coordination space, was to produce a protection report on the state of protection in Libya in 2023 by essentially the end of the year. Um, and so what ended up happening was by the March of, of this year uh, was that protection cell provided that report to the HCRC, uh, made a recommendation again that the protection coordination group was uh, needed, but a recommendation of where it could specifically fit within the structure. So instead of saying we need to have a protection group and sort of just, you know, focusing on that point, saying, OK, this is the new structure we have. Now, what are the needs related to Libya and where can we as a protection coordination group fit within this structure? So what the report that, that was produced told us was the vast majority of protection needs in Libya were for non-Libyans, so migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. Um, and if you recall those two working groups that I mentioned, uh, the one about uh, the internally displaced and uh, the other about migration management, uh, we sort of thought based on the report, why don't we fit this as a subgroup, the proposed coordination body, as a subgroup of migration management? So that second uh, place of coordination. Now, where we are right now is we're working on coming to some kind of agreement in the creation of this subgroup. So part of the reason that that is taking quite a bit of time is within the last essentially a year, there have been a couple uh, crises that have occurred in Libya um, that have really impacted kind of the protection coordination space. The first is there was some major flooding and landsliding, uh, sl landslides that occurred in Eastern Libya 
uh, around September of 2023. So that triggered the rapid response mechanism. It was kind of a mini humanitarian response structure uh, within which there was a protection uh, coordination task force. And that really focused again on the East. So not a national thing, just on the East. Uh, but that was phased out earlier this year, around April through June, um, in close coordination with the INGOs. Uh, and then the second crisis that occurred was uh, the massive influx of Sudanese refugees. Um, so now we have a, a refugee response led by UNHCR, and there is a protection task force um, co-chaired, as, as sort of is typical, um, in Libya by DRC. So, you know, we have a few ways of protection coordination to occur, um, but in kind of the Libya response, you know, it really would have been maybe a bit more effective for these conversations between the INGOs and, and the UN um, and those who are sort of planning the transition to include the, the INGOs in how that transition uh, should look like and, and, you know, how the different aspects, for example, protection cluster, um, how that can kind of transition uh, into the new sort of nexus structure. So I know it's a little bit complicated and a little bit com convoluted, but that's how it went from protection uh, cluster to this temporary protection uh, group and then to protection cell, which came up with a recommendation for hopefully what will be a subgroup under migration management. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Matthew. I think it's really helpful to, to get a bit of that picture of what this has looked like in, in Libya and, and the different stages of the transition process. And I think it does really illustrate that it's it's often um, often a gradual process, and, and there might be different iterations and different forms that the, the coordination takes over time. So um, I think that's a great way to kick off, and I think we'll we'll come back to you for some additional reflections later in the discussion. Um, but Tulu, maybe I can turn to you now, um, because I, I know the Iraq coordination transition was happening at at some around the same time, I think, uh, as the 2022 uh, transition planning was happening in Libya, um, mm -hmm. and and you were the protection cluster coordinator that was sort of grappling with some of these these issues in Iraq. And I would love to hear a little bit about your experiences with the transition there. Maybe some of the sort of protection challenges you were uh, thinking about, and as the sort of this transition and deactivation planning were. Uh, were occurring and and maybe a bit about sort of what your plans were, what your um, uh, what the approach was in Iraq to to ensuring this continuity of protection following the deactivation. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so basically, yes, I'll just set the scene for the situation in Iraq. Um, at the point of January 2022, so I think we were a bit ahead of uh, Libya, um, the humanitarian needs in, in Iraq had, uh, you know, had really shifted from uh, being 11 million people in need in 2017 to 2.5 million people in 2022. And I think as elsewhere, it is a political decision at the end of the day, right, that is taken by the humanitarian uh, coordination. So the HCT decided early on in January 2022 that the clusters should all be deactivated by the end of the year. So we had basically, uh, you know, one year was the timeline. And the argument also being that the needs were no, no longer humanitarian, but rather more development needs as the same time as uh, Iraq had really gained its financial independence through its oil re revenues. So that's to set the scene for you. And then, um, um, you know, also we had more than 80% of those 6 million people that had been displaced during Daesh had returned uh, to their areas of origin or elsewhere. Um, so, so that was basically the situation. In terms of protection concerns and protection risks, uh, what had been the main focus of the protection cluster uh, throughout uh, the years had been really access to civil documentation, um, in particular for IDPs, returnees, and vulnerable communities. Um, and this really access to civil documentation was a core activity of the cluster and all the protection partners to ensure that people could gain access to civil documentation and thereby access to services, freedom of movement, etc. 
And so those that were mostly affected by this and did not have this access and remained uh, was still uh, people with real or perceived affiliation to extremist groups, uh, but also some illiter illiterate populations and those in remote areas and those at risk of statelessness. So there were some different communities that were still at risk. So basically what we did with the protection cluster was to really try to uh, look into together with our members, including INGOs and NGOs, uh, what could be um, the way forward. And as our uh, colleague from Libya mentioned, similarly, uh, there was identified that there was a need for some kind of a coordination structure to remain. Um, although, as we know, UNSTCF was going to be in place and take over, but UNSTCF is a UN-led um, structure. So we wanted to have a structure that would have the local NGOs, INGOs, and UN all come together to ensure the centrality of protection and have a linkage at the same time to the UNSTCF. That was the plan in theory. Um, and so we created something called a protection platform in late 2022, early 2023, as the clusters were deactivated. So the, um, it was uh, UNHCR and OHCHR to, uh, who co-led this together. And there was a um, core group, including some UN entities, INGO, including DRC, and some other local NGOs as well. And basically the objective of the protection platform is to, it was to do coordination uh, on a high level uh, advocacy, because as mentioned, the main protection uh, concern and risk that was still remaining was access to civil documentation. And the idea was to um, try to coordinate and advocate on higher level with the government in terms of giving this access to all the population. Um, and also another, um, idea was to uh, guide uh, you know provide guidance to development partners etc and so this was why the protection platform was initiated and uh, started and i think um in the beginning it went very well and then i'll give you some updates on the current situation because i got some updates from my colleagues but just to give you uh, a little bit of the key learnings from the deactivation process and we did a survey with all the protection partners um, at the end of uh, the transition, uh, at the end of 2022. And basically what um, the partners, there were some main points that came out uh, as concerns from the protection partners that were very legitimate. And it was one on the government's capacity and funding. So although the government in theory has, has, has the funding uh, to support its citizens um, and others, um, there was this limited readiness uh, to, to do so and to take on the protection activities. And I think the reason why uh, we continued with protection platform uh, with UNHCR and OHCHR was before because there was not that readiness to give that over to the, to the government. Um, and then another issue uh, was allocated funding for protection services by the government. And then I think another issue that we saw within the within this transition was that, you know, lack of guidance to INGOs and NGOs on where to seek funding for protection activities after the cluster is deactivated. And I think this is a really important point because, you know, the protection cluster and the structure is linked to the HRP and all the partners um, are also, you know, reporting to the cluster because it's linked to HRP and there's this funding um there's there's like there's a funding approach to it so the partners know that they can also get the support of the cluster to seek funding etc through the hrp and through all the pool funds etc but i think that there was this misgap and the lack of guidance from our side from the protection cluster to be able to give our partners okay when the hrp is no longer in place when the cluster is no longer in place where should they go for funding we we basically didn't know where to lead them to be honest with you and also going back to the gpc or others we didn't have any guidance on where they should go other than to tell them you know you should try to go for development funding basically so i think that was a little bit i have to say something that there is a gap in that that we should think about for next time there is a transition situation but also the timeline of the deactivation 
And I know we really tried our best in Iraq to have a very inclusive approach, include all the INGOs and NGOs, and really try to do it as best way as possible to do an inclusive approach throughout the, um, the transition. But I do know that there was that feeling from especially the NGOs and INGOs that it was very UN led and it was very going very quickly and that, you know, there was more of a political decision rather than, you know, doing it in a way that was sustainable. And I think that goes back to something that I think we should all think about that, you know, when a humanitarian response starts at emergency stage, because after Iraq, I went to Myanmar and then I was mentioning that, you know, already when we are in emergency, we should be thinking about the end. We should be thinking about transition. We should already be preparing. Uh, do Are these activities sustainable? W what are we doing in terms of ensuring that the local NGOs are at the decision making table from the beginning, not just at the end? So I think these are things that we need to take with us, that transition and deactivation for the protection cluster, especially for protection activities, needs to be in place already at the beginning, not just like as an afterthought, so to speak. So I think that's something that's really important in terms of transition and something that we really learned in Iraq. And just to, uh, I see that I'm, I'm running over time a little bit, but just to give you an idea of what happened with the protection platform, because as mentioned, we activated it end of 2022, early 2023. But now speaking with colleagues that are in Iraq now, basically the protection platform is still in place uh, between UNHCR and OHCHR. But it seems like it's been a lot on UNHCR's shoulders, unfortunately, and not so much um, you know, initiatives by OHCHR. And then in the beginning, there was a lot of UN, other UN agencies that were in place. But for those of you that are familiar with UNSTCF, UNSTCF itself has a lot of working groups and a lot of demand on the UN agencies and what they should do and how what they should fill up. So the idea was that the protection flag platform would serve as a linkage between the UNSTCF and the protection concerns and centrality of protection. But my understanding is that that linkage, it's there's still a gap. It, it's it seems like those those two components have not really been speaking to each other. And so 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 that's a shame that that there is that gap, but it also teaches us that we should maybe think about if we're putting something in place, it should be something that will be helpful and useful to that new structure that is not humanitarian, right? Um, but then my understanding is that the focus has still been civil documentation um, and protection for minorities. So those two um, protection concerns, protection activists has, have still been taking place and been, been, been the focus of the platform. Um, but I think one thing to rem uh, remember is that the platform did not have a uh, funding um, component, let's say, so couldn't support uh, the partners with funding, which I think, again, is something that we should really consider when we're thinking about if we're putting some a new uh, mechanism in place after the cluster, it should be able to, if not support with funding, at least have a guidance on you know where to go next for the for for the different um, partners, etc. I mean, I have a lot more I can tell you, but I'm going to stop there. And then, if you have uh, questions, we can continue. Wonderful! Thanks so much, Tulu. I think that's um, yeah. I think you've touched on a lot of issues we're going to pick up on. So thank you so much. I think these points around how we can sort of prepare much earlier for these types of transitions, how we can engage with local local actors, uh, national counterparts are all things we're going to come back to. So thanks for queuing us up so well. Um, and of course you highlighted the, the issues around funding. So I want to stay with uh, Iraq for a moment um, and turn to Christophe, who was with, uh, who was the ECHO head of office uh, during this transition. Um, and Christophe, I think it would be really interesting to hear um, a little bit from the from the ECHO perspective, what were some of the conversations that were um, happening in the donor space? How were donors involved um, in these conversations around the, the transition broadly, around the protection issues in, in particular? I, I imagine that this had both a, a you know, a, a funding dimension, but then also a strategic dimension. So I think it would be really interesting to, to hear some of your reflections. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's Okay, I'm I'm gonna try to remember a bit the uh, the, the the 
let's say, the deep context in, in, in which we, we as humanitarian donors, but especially as the, uh, the EU humanitarian aid, we were trying to position ourselves in a, a, a kind of a strange situation because it was clearly, definitely a very protracted situation where the solution were mm, definitely not perfect when we were uh, looking at it. And we were also mainly dealing with just the rema a, a remaining caseload of people that were extremely vulnerable, but they were also extremely exposed because the majority of most of the people that were, uh, let's say, affected during the uh, the IS conflict, well, they, they went back. They were not really you know, depending on any humanitarian aid or any assistance. They were more depending on uh, their family networks or community networks. The, 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 our main, uh, I would say the, in, in, in the, all the story of the, uh, HRP, the closing of the clusters, uh, we, and especially as ECHO, we suddenly were more concerned by one decision from the government, which was the, the closure of the remaining camps. Because we knew that the, uh, the remaining IDP camps were the one hosting the people with, most of the problem, especially the most serious problem in terms of, especially in terms of protection. And when the government decided to close the camps, you know, in usually it was, well, just a couple of days or a couple of weeks uh, in terms of closing the camps, this is where we started definitely to go into a kind of a more protection attitude. And this is also where we were approaching OHCHR, we are approaching UNHCR, and we had, because uh, from an ECHO point of view, we had the uh, the advantage of being close to the EU delegation, and then that opened us uh, that opened sorry the uh, for us the a good advocacy and lobby tool, especially with the government. So that was a good an advantage for us because we were able to relay the uh, let's say humanitarian concern either from the uh, the UN agencies but most of the time with the INGOs and we were able to relay and to try to lobby a bit the, the government with that I would say that we were not really that successful but at, in some instances we were able to postpone the decision and that helped us to try to put in place the let's say alternative solution on that. I'm not entirely sure that, and I left, so I can't really, uh, I can't really speak about it, but I don't think that we were super successful in that. And I would imagine that there is a lot of the people that were in the IDP camps that were supposed to be closed that are now somewhere in informal sites or in the slums around the big cities in um, in Iraq, and this is where I I see it as not that a successful type of things. I'd like to also come back to a uh, something that uh, Tolo mentioned, which is the protection platform, because it was linked with the fact that the RCHC was closing the clusters, or at least proposing to close the cluster at a very short notice. But this is where we also uh, had the uh, the problem of the camp closure coming right at us, and this is when we engage with OHCHR, with UNHCR, to try to see how we will be able to have this kind of an intermediate platform, or at least a system that would be able to gather all the information and try to see how it was possible to, well, I would not say address, because we did not really address the problem of the camp closure, as I said, but at least to mitigate the, uh, the, the most immediate consequences. We, somehow we did it. The platform was created. This was a, a place uh, where, yeah, organizations were exchanging. At that time, uh, ECHO funded uh, the platform, so it, that was something uh, running. So now I don't know where it stands in terms of funding, uh, but it's uh, it definitely something that we uh, really appreciated because, uh, as I said, it allow us to put in place and most of the time rushing the things, but to mitigate a bit the uh, the idea of uh, clothing the camp. Uh, 
on the from a, uh, a a donor and financing point of view, the transition was a bit a, a, a kind of a strange uh, period of time for us because we were with reducing uh, humanitarian funding in this country, while I would not say that the development funding were increasing for very valid reason, which is the fact that Iraq is the rich country with a lot of money, and it's just a question of governance and willingness of the government to support a lot of things. Even sometimes we were the one advocating for the government to support humanitarian uh, support to certain type of population, including the IDPs in camps, which were not frankly happy to do, but okay, we were advocating for that. And uh, there is also one thing that we have to uh, we have to put in the picture is the the fact that we were still in a post IS conflict, and that is also something that I would I would say today that the humanitarian community and the humanitarian donors were not really equipped to deal with is the fact that you have still a IS print or IS. Well, yes, I would say IS print. That's just to simplify a bit the uh, the situation. Is the fact that you still have communities that were traumatized by IS, undealt with, and it was not a question of protection. It was a complete different type of things. You got communities that were still tagged as uh, what we call at that time the perceived affiliated communities, and that is also something that I don't think that the protection program that we had at that time were really addressing the, the cause of that. It's deeper uh, than a protection program. It was definitely linked with families, communities. It was linked with trauma. And uh, I'm not entirely sure that the, uh, the what, what we put in place were really addressing this. We, we manage, I'm sure it helped, but I'm not entirely convinced that that was certainly a sustainable type of solution that we were providing to these communities. And uh, in, it, it's within this kind of a context that, uh, and I will uh, take what Tolo said as well, was from an echo, uh, again, analysis, the aspect that was the most important and certainly the most efficient to deal with was the lack of civil documentation. And then we decided to put all our efforts into it because simply by the fact that uh, some of these people were able to show a small plastic ID cards was opening a lot of services and suddenly it was also providing solution for families. And this is where, uh, again, we went, I would say, heavy on this one, and we linked the civil documentation with the protection platform. So that was a kind of a big, uh, big aspect, at least in the last, uh, I left in 2023, so tw late 22, but the, most of 23, that was the, I would say, the, the objective of, a coup in, uh, in Iraq was mainly only protection, but even within the protection, no, well, we have the special vulnerable that we're taking care of. Yes, that was our line and mandate in terms of protection. But within the protection, as I said, the civil documentation was the core uh, of our activity. And I, I, would, I, would, I would say that, again, Iraq being a rich country with a system in place that was somehow functioning for us, it was also a way to not remain as a frontliner in terms of supplier of anything addressing needs, but rather to stepping back and trying to involve, and it was already a uh, good thing that because we had the authorities and the different, uh, the, the, the different services from the government being involved in uh, releasing the uh, civil documentation. And that was definitely for us 
the way of, let's say, getting out of the place and again try to push for the government to get into it. And it was not only uh, in terms of official camps, because we were able, I remember, to drag the authorities into the slums, into the informal sites, for them to be able to start to, you know, to collect the biometrics in order to release the civil documentation or in some instance also to check because that was again what I, I said about the uh, the affiliation the authorities were also here to check so but that's another story with regard to ministry of justice and protection and it's certainly uh well maybe not the topic of the day well that's all i would say for the time being thanks a lot no thanks so much christophe i think that um that's a really helpful helpful overview and i think captures the really the the challenges and the complexities of dealing with these types of um transitions even in contexts where as you say you have a a wealthy government you have um many conditions that should somehow enable these uh, these issues to be dealt with but even still it's not easy so um so thanks for helping to to touch on on some of those points and i think something else that stands out is is really the importance of thinking both about the sort of immediate uh, remaining uh, protection concerns, camp closures, perhaps in Iraq, as well as these longer term protection issues that are essential for the sustainability, the documentation in your case. Um, so I think maybe picking up on this sustainability point, I, I want to turn now to, to Ukraine, um, where we're not seeing a formal coordination transition yet, but where I think national and local actors are already playing a very strong role in coordination leadership and in putting in place that foundation for long-term approaches to, to protection issues. Um, uh, we know in, in Ukraine, there's been discussions about transitions also to different types of coordination models at the subnational level. Um, and, and that this is already in, in different ways, part of the, the, the thinking there. So Sasha, your organization, R2P, co-coordinates the, the national protection cluster in Ukraine. Uh, it would be great if maybe you could tell us a little bit about the sort of the coordination context and, and what we can learn from your experiences in Ukraine. Um, and maybe also if we are to look to the future, what would you need as a, as a local protection actor if we were eventually to see sort of a more formalized deactivation of the, the, the clusters? Thank you, Carmen. You, you have already covered some important things uh, what I was planning to convey today. And uh, thank you very much for inviting to, to have a speech. And uh, uh, indeed, Ukraine kind of a very complex uh, context, uh, having in mind that uh, as there is a strong government, uh, there is a strong uh, and developed civil society, and it's a protracted conflict. So that uh, despite the fact that there is a a vast, uh, huge uh, needs uh, for humanitarian assistance. So uh, uh, in parallel, we have quite a lot of uh, already so-called, let's say, nexus and uh, uh, development uh, uh, needs on the ground. And uh, sometimes they're so mixed up. So and it's uh, it's very difficult to distinguish sometimes. And people uh, for whom we actually provide this assistance, they do not really distinguish between whether it's a uh, humanitarian or nexus or development one. So that's uh, the major point here is to really just to have uh, uh, this uh, coherent and uh, uh, and. Um, uh, complex uh, and uh, complex ap uh, approach to to help people in such a uh, let's say complex uh, uh, environment. So, and uh, I just would like to start uh, with uh, some background on uh, right to protection, and it was established in two thousand and thirteen as an independent NGO. Previously, it was operating under highest umbrella. Highest is a U.S.-based NGO. And since 2014, R2P has been helping internal displaced and conflict-affected people, in addition to the assistance to refugees and stateless in Ukraine. We've been active, particularly in the sphere of protection, and was an active member of the protection cluster, which was also activated in 2014. And in 2022, with uh, the full-scale invasion, uh, R2P was invited to coordinate, uh, co-coordinate uh, the protection cluster. Uh, 
and such a co coordination was formalized uh, in February 2023. Uh, in 2023, R2P also became a SOG member in the uh, Global Protection Cluster. And uh, since we've been uh, We've been almost uh, ten years uh, in in this uh, in this context, and based on our experience and lessons learned, I would like to say uh, actually several w words about transition. So in in Ukraine, we have a couple of let's say tr uh, potential transitions. First of all, of course, it's uh, having as as I mentioned. Uh, as we have quite a strong government and uh, civil society. So it's quite natural to have this transi transition towards them. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the traditional cluster uh, coordination. And on top of that, so since it, uh, since it's, uh, we have, we are already in three years uh, of uh, the full-scale invasion. So we have both uh, um, humanitarian and uh, com uh, and uh, and development needs, so there is a need, a strong need in transition, and of at least some uh, uh, strong co coordination between these two wings, let's say. So, uh, and I would, in terms of uh, transition uh, from the uh, from the traditional cluster coordination to to other actors. So, firstly, there is always a need for a, a data-driven transition plan, prepared in a consultative manner with uh, local NGOs and local and national governments. The launch of this plan must be quite timely, not premature, not overdue. And the second, secondly, to have a proper coordination, coordination in such a complex and huge context as Ukraine, with, as I said, strong government and, and professional and well-developed civil society, one needs to uh, employ not only the traditional cluster-based coordination, but also an area-based one. So, and, uh, in the Ukrainian context from 2014 uh, until 22, the humanitarian response coordination was focusing predominantly on the eastern region of Ukraine with high hostilities, while the protection cluster maintained its coverage across the regions that hosted the largest numbers of IDPs, mainly uh, west of Ukraine. And since the armed conflict was stalled and was not causing new waves of mass displacement, in 2019, there was an attempt to start a transition process, and the clusters uh, developed transition strategies, identifying counterparts at national and regional levels, uh, defining bench benchmarks for handover of coordination activities, and uh, the clusters um, with were at different speed in terms of implementation of, the, of their strategies. Uh, however, even for the clusters, they were more for those who were more advanced, and uh, transition was not successful due to lack of an agreement from the state to take over responsibility for coordination. Negotiations of transition plan plans were taking place between the clusters and identified counterparts, and lacked political support at the strategic level. Uh, uh, actually. Uh, for instance, when a line minister or local authorities concluded that they have no resources for coordination, they have stopped further progress. So it is unlikely to have an inefficient transition from the cluster system without active involvement of the state and without securing uh, the agreement to take over coordination at the highest political level. That, that the authorities should not only know that the cluster system means, but also actively participate in the planning of transition and commit to allocate resources for coordination. And the role of civil society is also of a paramount importance for transition. Ideally, the government and NGOs should be prepared to cooperate for and coordinate together the humanitarian response. Uh, for now, in terms of practical steps for potential transition of the protection cluster in Ukraine. It is exager exaggerated by the fact that there is no one government body in this case. In Ukraine, the uh, protection cluster cooperates with at least the Minister of Social Policy and the Minister of Reintegration. And uh, for example, the later one is to be liquidated soon, with handing over its responsibilities to various ministries. This is this in itself is a challenge as it fragments the government response to internal displacement and war-related challenges. And in addition to, uh, to coordination of protection services and assistance, the protection cluster has a role in protection monitoring and advocacy. And there should be a strategy for handover. 
and these activities uh, to civil society and the government. One of the possible remedies in this situation may be proper data collection, as I said, uh, reflecting the, uh, the profile of conflict affected population through, throughout the territory of Ukraine, as well as capacity of uh, respective service providers, along with local authorities. In such a manner, it would be possible to estimate what fraction of services could be covered by the state, define gaps, and needs for additional support from NGOs in terms of operational response, and then depending on the scope of factors to determine appropriate local coordination models. Uh, while at the national level, there are obstacles for transition efforts. Locally, some aspects, uh, aspects of such transition at regional level have already happened. Uh, at the onset of the emergency in 2022, the Ministry of Reintegration established so-called coordination centers to respond for related humanitarian challenges, such as IDP-related issues, evacuation of civil population. These huge problems require a united approach of different partners. And this forward proved to be efficient to operate and resolve issues at the regional and even at national level. Simultaneously, in certain eastern and southern regions, uh, national and local NGOs, along with volunteers, established local intersectoral coordination systems and these coordination systems cooperate with local authorities. So they, uh, so that they together respond to specific needs of conflict affected population and engage with the clusters to facilitate cooperation with international humanitarian coordination system. Um, I would say that it's, it's still a long way to go and, uh, and given uh, active hostilities in the Eastern Ukraine causing uh, just acquired uh, a uh, series of evacuation of civilians to all over Ukraine. It's too early to start uh, uh, any transition. However, it's about uh, it's about time to start planning it, uh, guaranteeing that uh, guaranteeing that national and local authorities as well as area-based coordination entities are on board from the very beginning. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasa. I think that's a, a really important message that even if it's too early to transition, it's never too early to start planning for a transition. And I think you've you've given us some really helpful insights into what that looks like in Ukraine and maybe some ideas of what that could also look like in other contexts. So so thanks a lot for that. Um, I would like to turn now to, to Reina um, with the Commission of Human Rights in the, the Philippines. Reina, I know it's very late for you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're really excited to, to hear your perspective. I think one of the concerns that often comes up in context of transition is how we can preserve the protection of, of the rights of marginalized and persecuted groups following the deactivation of a protection cluster. And this is, of course, something that human rights actors like the Commission of Human Rights always work on, uh, but perhaps takes on even greater importance if we're seeing a reduction in the presence of, of international actors. Could you share your thoughts maybe on the role of national human rights institutions in, in these types of contexts and in sort of the preservation of, um, of the protection of, of marginalized groups and, and what can we learn from your work in the Philippines? Over to you. Yes, thank you, Kaylin, and um, good evening to everyone and a good day. Um, so before I discuss the work of uh, the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines in relation to um, humanitarian protection and the work of the clusters. I'll ju I just want to give a very brief context in the country. So uh, Philippines were an ar archipelago state in the Pacific Ring of Fire and also in the Pacific Typhoon Belt. So it's uh, we have a lot of natural disasters happening year in and year out in the country. We are also have uh, centuries of armed conflict in different fronts in the country. So you can see here humanitarian age, uh, emergencies uh, often result from uh, both disasters and um, conflicts, as well as other crisis contexts. So how it does how it looks like in the Philippines when it comes to response is we have our line agencies uh, such as the social development um, this, uh, department, the education department, and others, and um, we conduct our response uh, in relation to our law on disaster risk reduction and management act which uh, creates the framework for humanitarian actors in the country uh, from the government side to respond to 
um, humanitarian emergencies. However, um, when emergencies happen, we also activate our uh, clusters for primarily for coordination and response where the government, uh, international organizations, and NGOs get to work together. So this is uh, the protection cluster as we have now. So right now, the Philippines uh, lead, uh, the government of the Philippines leads the protection cluster with the UNHCR acting as the lead for the protection cluster within the UN humanitarian country team. So this means that um, most of the work really on response is with the government. Uh, and uh, that is also in relation to our DRRM law. Uh, presence of international actors is there, but limited compared to the government. So if, uh, as you can see, though we I cannot say it's like a fully transitioning a mechanism wherein international actors would be stepping out. But uh, we see this as being a nationally led uh, cluster where um, there is still the presence of our international partners, but at the same time, the government really takes the cudgels in relation to providing response uh, in humanitarian emergencies in the country. Um, this is also where uh, the work of the, the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines is crucial. Because even though we we have the protection cluster, we also have to note that there are many um, marginalized and vulnerable sectors that get to um, not be seen um, in, the, in the response that is being conducted by, by the government, may it be because of... Um, uh, lack of su of substantial knowledge on human rights in relation to providing humanitarian response to communities. Uh, and uh, that's where the CHRP uh, cements its role as we do the monitoring, facilitation, and reporting in relation to um, human rights issues in humanitarian contexts. So from our um, experience, um, the CHRP as an independent human rights institution, uh, which is mandated by the Philippine Constitution, uh, conducts its monitoring of human rights and uh, um, other reporting activities in relation to crisis and conflict settings. So um, IDP communities, indigenous peoples in humanitarian settings, as well as other affected communities are um, part of the sectors that we look into. So how we do it is we go to the ground, do our monitoring activities, look at you specific human rights issues such as um, civil and political rights concerns, uh, right to food, right to shelter, right to water, etc. So different rights that we look into. And um, coming from our monitoring activities, we link communities with decision makers through our community-based dialogues, human rights monitoring, and also coming up with policy recommendations. So we also do advocacy for human rights laws, such as Protection for Internally Displaced Persons um, Bill, which uh, we are actively advocating with our Congress. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. We also assist communities when it comes to grievance redress as well as uh, reporting of human rights issues. So um, while the protection cluster is very focused on the provision of relief and also for coordination of work, the CHRP acts as uh, some kind of a watchdog in ensuring that in the provision of these services, um, communities' voices, uh, people's voices are still heard and included in program in the programming of humanitarian response uh, in their areas. So that's where uh, the NHRIs are important because while there is uh, this mechanism where the government is leading the response in relation to um, humanitarian agencies, human rights remain to be paramount. And in many instances, human um, in many instances when it comes to emergencies, human rights get to be forgotten when the response has to be quick and even communities themselves, even the people themselves think that their survival um, must be the first priority and their human rights will have to be neglected and they were fine with it. To which the human rights, uh, the CHRP would say now your human rights remain to be of paramount as well as with the humanitarian response being provided to the communities. So, we have what we call as well um, 
presence uh presence as protection we're in the presence of the commission on human rights uh in the communities itself creates a protective framework uh and mechanism for the idps to uh rely on to so we support referral pathways particularly when it comes to sexual and gender based uh violence uh, as uh, the chr is the gender on board of the philippines as well as uh, we do referrals of protection issues to the cluster and we advocate for local humanitarian protection uh, laws so uh yeah with that uh, that's uh, how we have done our work in relation to human rights in humanitarian response in the country and our role within the protection cluster as a national human rights institution. So, yeah, um, with that, thank you so much, Kaylin, and I hope I was able to share something of value and of interest to our colleagues in the call. Thank you. Very much, Reina. Thank you so much. I think it's it's really helpful to have your reflections and I think points to the fact that um, even in a uh, countries that are characterized by conflict, uh, perhaps subnational conflicts as well, there are um, allies within the human rights world, uh, human, national human rights institutions, other human rights actors that uh, can be, as Reina, you said, an independent watchdog for the rights of, of marginalized and persecuted groups. So um, I think that's a, a useful reflection for all of us, for colleagues working all over the world, that um, that we we can can look uh, across governments to see where we can find actors we can can engage with and across the human rights world uh, in in embarking on these transition processes. So thank you so much, um, colleagues. We have about just under thirty minutes remaining uh, with us, and I do want to hopefully have some time to take questions that are coming up in the Q&A. So if you have not already done so and, and you have any questions, please do feel free to add it to the, to the Q&A, uh, which should be at the bottom of your screens somewhere. Um, and while you're reflecting, I want to maybe just take the opportunity to ask one more question of all of our panelists, um, which is if you have one reflection, one piece of advice for a colleague who um, is looking to the future to a transition in their in their context, uh, what would your advice to them be? Um, let's maybe take two minutes maximum each, uh, just so we have time for, for Q&A. And uh, I think we'll just follow the same order we've gone in. So Matthew, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin, for this important question. Um, I mean, from my perspective, INGOs play multiple roles in humanitarian nexus contexts. Um, and as implementers, they often have direct knowledge of the challenges and needs on the ground, but they also have a kind of an understanding of global policy, learnings from other contexts. So it's crucial that they be involved in strategic planning from the beginning. We saw this work particularly well in Libya when we transitioned from a humanitarian flood response back to the nexus response. From the start, the resident coordinator's office in OCHA involved INGOs and the LIF in planning how that transition would go. And it was quite smooth. Um, so if your country is planning this nexus sort of transition, include INGOs. And that can be most effectively done through INGO form like our own, but from the very beginning, in planning, in drafting how the transition will occur, best recommendation from my side. Thanks so much, Matthew. And I think um, something that we can take away also at the global level when we're thinking of this is some of the challenges that you and other colleagues have highlighted in the sense that NGOs have much less of a formalized place in the development coordination architecture. We're not partners in cooperation frameworks. We don't sit on UN country teams. Um, I say we because I am, of course, with an NGO as well. Um, so it does require us to, to really think what this looks like, how, how NGOs can continue to, to have a role um, following the, the exit of a formal humanitarian coordination architecture. So thanks so much for, for raising that. Um, Tulu, let's turn over to you now. Yes, I mean, from my side, I think a few points, uh, things to think about uh, for future. Um, one thing is that, you know, resources in terms of not only funding, but also personnel. So, I mean, when we had the transition and deactivation process in Iraq, um, I had the, you know, opportunity to stay on 
longer. So I was there throughout the process of the transition. And then I took on another role with UNHCR, uh, coordinating the protection platform and could take that forward as well with the support of UNHCR. But I think it's very important to have also resources and staff members that can kind of bra bridge the gap between the humanitarian transition and when we go into the, the nexus or development. So I think that's also something to really consider. But then again, uh, an another point I just wanted to make, as I mentioned before, really in terms of funding and for INGOs and NGOs. I really wanna push this forward again, just because I think it's very important. And as we know, UNSTCF is really mainly for UN only. So I think that's something to consider some of the protection issues that continue and some of the partners, for example, in Iraq, continue to stay in Iraq and deliver and uh, support in terms of access to civil documentation, et cetera, and to ensure that those partners also have access to funding and support them with what funding streams to go, to go after in the transition. And then the last point, I think something that maybe Sasha also mentioned is very important is in terms of really thinking about transition early on and then the context to transition to localization and the, and the, and the bridge there and how important it is to early on start and really capacitate local organizations, have them at the decision making table and ensure that they are a part of the humanitarian structure from top to bottom. Uh, and then that because those are the ones that will be remaining once that humanitarian structure and all the funding disappears. So I think that's really a really important point as well. Thanks so much to Lou. I, and I'm sure Sasha will have other thoughts on how we can uh, enable that and support that from early on as well. So, so thanks a lot. Christoph, let's turn to you. Uh, Christoph, I, I think you might be muted. Ah, voila, perfect. Okay, thanks. The, um, for the I, I would say there are still, let's say, pending points that, uh, well, I'm not any longer uh, able to, to, to deal with that. But I think there is uh, overall something that is, again, linked with the different type of communities we were let's say, talking about and trying to support. And uh, it's, uh, uh, again, there is a common link about all this group of population in terms of especially in protection, is uh, the type of impact, and especially the, the non-obvious impact that can happen within communities when we move people, when we reintegrate people, when we try to reconcile uh, group of population, I, I have the feeling that this is maybe something that was uh, overlooked, especially in Iraq. I don't, I don't know if it's still a valid point as of today. I don't know where it stands today in terms of the displaced or the former displaced population, where they stand, if they are uh, reintegrated or if they are now part of the, well, the, the, the let's say the, the poor uh, part of the of the uh, Iraqi population, and therefore they're gonna well, they're gonna find their ways wherever they are, whether it's in a in a normal community, whether it's a slum, a slum, sorry, around uh, around Mosul or around Baghdad. But it's the uh, it's something that definitely uh, goes beyond the humanitarian mandate. That's for sure. But it's uh, also something in principle that should be part of a government mandate because it's a uh, their own population there is like but i think it's the uh, especially in the uh, iraq context that is something that would be easily forgotten because uh, well nobody has a real solution how to deal with that and therefore uh, these these problems will be put aside and uh, well, and everybody will hope that the life will go on, and that's it. But the problem is, the major protection issue will remain. And uh, and again, I uh, yeah, I don't think that's a uh, a humanitarian actor uh, task. But still, still, uh, as long as you got uh, protection groups, or if you have even protection uh, organization that are there. 
it's something that should be again okay, bring yeah no these things should not disappear so that's uh, certainly part of a kind of a repetitive advocacy or lobby or it's uh, could be the job of the Iraqi uh, human human rights council for example but another another discussion and definitely not a task of a, a humanitarian organization i would say thank you Thanks so much, Christophe. And I think even as you say, if it's not um, even if it's not the task of a humanitarian organization or, or the protection cluster, I think it is useful for us to have that orientation in mind uh, from from the early stages. And there will be a separate session during these two weeks of the, the Global Protection Forum that does look at solutions and, and how we can engage and support solutions. And I think many of the points you're raising are, are really vital to that, that a, a solution isn't just about people moving out of an IDP camp to another location. It's really about reintegration and the extent to which they've been able to reintegrate into society um, and uh, and rebuild their lives uh, independent of, of the humanitarian system. So thanks for, for flagging those points. Uh, Sasha, let's turn to you. Thank you. Um... As, as, as we discussed, so uh, uh, there are uh, there is a number of transitions. Let's say so. Uh, I mean, by type. So that's, for instance, a uh, 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 cluster transition, which is supposed to to transfer some uh, responsibilities of the traditional cluster system to to new actors. Let's say, and uh, uh, nexus transition. So, and uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the nexus transition. And sometimes they actually may may happen uh, subsequently. Sometimes they may run in parallel. So and it is, actually it makes this picture more complicated sometimes. So really just to distinguish where we have to to put our focus. Uh, but um, in terms of, for instance, nexus transition, it's uh, I mean again. So based on my experience, so it's it's. Uh, and then specifically in a context when uh, humanitarian funding is shrinking, so and uh, uh, and still there is a, a number of needs, humanitarian needs. So uh, uh, those who are in charge of the humanitarian response, they try really just to focus and to narrow down to very much life-saving things. On the other hand, when we have development uh, needs, so uh, we have development donors, those who actually provide funding for this, and then sometimes protection as kind of nexus activities, they fall between the cracks because neither the humanitarian donors nor uh, development donors uh, are really not in charge of, I mean, they do not provide funding for this particular, let's say, in between uh, activities. So. And that's my, my my point is that it's uh, we've been discussing many of like very much actively in Ukraine right now. So that under even uh, some donors, those who have even just uh, those who operate under the same roof, I, I mean, like USAID or uh, UK. So uh, development and uh, humanitarian donors, they have to cooperate way more closer than they do right now. So in specifically in order just to really to be more efficient uh, and to really to cover those needs who might uh, disappear from the from from the rudder because of these very much different hats. So and uh, when it comes to the cluster transition, as, as I said, so it's 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 extremely important to to be uh, to have realistic expectations. And uh, very much important to to to, to understand the uh, the uh, the context and um, um, the landscape in terms of uh, stakeholders, and just to really not to impose on the stakeholders uh, this over let's say duty. So, but really just to be realistic and to 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 give some time, to give some space, to really just to develop this transition with time. So, and of course, accountability to affect the population, which is not supposed to be forgotten here, because again, so again, I have been witnessing many, like some transitions, which are really being done in order just to transit something without having in mind that still there is a huge needs, which needs to be covered. And then we need just to really to, to involve our beneficiaries in these transition processes as well. Uh, so I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha. I think those are really important points. And I think this dimension of 
um, really involving the, the, the communities themselves uh, as part of these conversations, having very open discussion and dialogue with them to, to also help them to, to prepare and to make their own decisions about what they do in, in view of possible changes and in, in what might be coming in, in the response is really important. So thanks so much for, for bringing that in. Um, Raina, let's, uh, let's turn to you now, please. Yeah, thank you, Kaylin. Um, maybe my piece of advice would be more on the institutionalized institution institutionalization side. Uh, we're in um mission from response to development. Um, I think it would be important if um human rights mechanisms will be institutionalized, or if there are already human rights institutions, they will be empowered to. Um, delve more into humanitarian action activities because human rights and humanitarian action uh, go together and um, when clusters transition to development, human rights must still be at the heart of that transition. So human rights institutions would act as independent um, independent agencies as, and they can be you know conscious of the government they can exercise a mandate to assess and review the mechanisms and response of the government and the human rights institutions have strong mandates that can facilitate dialogues between um the people and the government or also pro refer protection issues can provide uh what we call presence as protection advocate for rights of persons in crisis and conflict situations and even when clusters have, uh, begin to move out of uh, uh country contexts human rights institutions are um already embedded in how the government conducts its work so we also see here that residual protection issues can be covered by HRI simply because of the mandate that they already exercise. Human rights institutions exist even beyond protection clusters. And colleagues uh, in the call may take advantage of that, that um, they can bank on the power of HRIs as a power uh, as a partner rather in supporting communities, even when uh, clusters uh, leave or deactivate in country context. So there, thank you, Kaylin. Thanks so much, Reina. Um, and and I think really, really useful in sort of flagging the, the role NHRIs and uh, and sort of similar actors can play in helping to facilitate the dialogue uh, as well. I think that's a, a really valuable um, uh, role that NHRIs can play that maybe we don't uh, make enough use of uh, in these types of contexts. So thanks so much for flagging. We have about 10 minutes remaining, um, and I think there's been a lot of questions coming up in, in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, it's hard to, to even know where, where to start on these, but one thing that I think has, has come up a number of times is um, a, a not easy question, a rather sensitive question, which is how do we deal um, with transitions that are occurring in less than ideal conditions where perhaps we don't see uh, an enormous amount of um, willingness of national authorities to, um, to be involved in the transition, to step up and sort of uh, take on some more of the, the protection responsibilities um, or in fragile contexts where we see that maybe um, there are changes happening in in. Uh, the the broader sort of atmosphere that could influence the um, the success of a transition, um, and I think there there are some questions around how how can we coming from all of your your different roles your different perspectives um, how can we support effective transitions even in contexts where maybe the conditions are less than ideal. Um, so I don't know if there's any of you that would be interested to uh, to pick up on that. I think many of you have shared thoughts that speak to this question already, um, but I think it it does seem to come up very often when we have conversations around transition and and its intersection with the protection environment that somehow the the ideal transition is maybe not always the most common transition in terms of the factors that precipitate it. So. Um, would any of you like to, to jump in on that? Otherwise I can flag some of the other questions that have popped up, but let me pause for a moment for our panelists. Can I just uh, let's say reflect on one thing, especially from a, a donor point of view. 
I don't think that there was anywhere a successful transition that was, uh, you know, taking place in a wonderful world where everything is fine. No, it does not. It does not because we are never either with the right amount of funding, with the right amount of policy and the, with the right program transitioning from one to another one. So I, in a maybe a bit of a provocative manner, I would say, well, it's a fact of life. Transition will be difficult. It's going to be, uh, well, certainly part of a struggle for some. We know, and it, I, I know it's extremely sad, but we know that some of our let's say people we're trying to support will be left aside because the transition will not will not be able to address all the needs of the entire population it's not possible and uh, we uh, again we as as echo we were engaged in the nexus yes we are usually working in very fact when there is a delegation with in power services we're trying to work in, in definitely in close Collaboration, we're trying to have this famous two or three years plan, but does not does not really work. So I I would suggest that, uh, but again, I, I think it's a, a donor advice is to choose one sector and one area and stick to it. But it's, it's a choice. It's a choice that each organization, let's say an organization will have to make because again, trying to go for a full-fledged transition that will be successful might be a dream. And therefore, at the end of the day, you simply will have you know, a lot of frustration because the program will not have worked. On the other hand, if you frame a bit, um, even a bit, if you frame a lot your action, your objective, there maybe you might be more successful in, in terms of transition. And you might also uh, be able to attract a more again focused interest for a development donor or a non humanitarian donor. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christoph. I think it's a, a good reality check that uh, in messy transitions uh, and and we should prepare for that, even if it's uh, not easy. So thank you, Matthew. Did I see your hand starting to oh. sneak up earlier? Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, happy to to just add a little bit onto what Christoph said. Just in terms of Libya, you know, the authorities are not involved in protection coordination uh, here. Um, but I think really creating safe space, safe spaces such as coordination groups for INGOs and UN agencies to have those kind of sensitive discussions on how best to address the protection needs in their context is one thing. The other thing is, as uh, Tulu was saying earlier, making sure there's funding for that coordination and making sure there's capacity for that coordination. So it isn't just about, you know, let's create a safe space, but making sure from the donor side that they're putting into ensuring that that space can exist and continue to exist where and when appropriate. Thanks so much. Uh, I think Reina was first and then Sasha. Reina, please. Yes, thank you. Um, very um, good insights from our colleagues. Uh, maybe just to contribute to the uh, conversation in relation to how um, to build good uh, relationships with the clusters and the government to ensure that there would be smooth transition um, once the clusters would deactivate. Um, it's important, at, at least in the context of the Philippines, that there should be a trust building um, mechanism between the clusters as well as um, with the government when it comes to transition. Um, it is not an easy um, task, especially if we get to see that the governments might not be able to fully sustain uh, the gains of the cluster. However, uh, that trust building process would be uh, an opportunity to provide more uh, capacity to the government so that they may be able to um to take on the work of the clusters as well as to also um provide that opportunity for the people to put in their trust as well with uh, the with the government as the most ideal we get to see is the government will be the one to continue with the development strategies and uh, um and um solutions for the people so yeah i think uh, all of the sectors involved in the clusters would be uh, important in conducting the trust building mechanism so that transition would be smooth uh, once the clusters deactivate. Thanks so much, Reina. Uh, Sasha, please. 
Yeah, very, uh, very, very short. So that's uh, very, um, I believe that it's very much important to really just to convey uh, uh, the information about the cluster system and to make it as wide as possible to to have this uh, awareness raising as wide as possible. Because, for instance, here we we've been a little bit uh, trapped in the situation that not many actors, those we want just to uh, to take over, are really aware of what uh, the cluster system does. So that uh, I mean, in in all this nitty gritties are very much important as well. Because also many many uh, believe that the cluster system uh, works in order just to generate funding. Uh, then coordination is goes next. And uh, the the uh, the other point is uh, the another point that uh, 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 an exit strategy or a transition strategy should be, be should be prepared from day one when the cluster is established. So, uh, so, so because we have already a lot of uh, examples uh, across the globe, so that might be somehow uh, uh, analyzed. And uh, of course, I. I understand that contexts are so different, and uh, but we we need just to really to categorize them maybe, and to see where we what we can apply, and not just to really to invent a bicycle uh, every time as we want just to 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 have this exit strategy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha. I think that's a, a great note to conclude on. Uh, that we we need to be thinking about. Uh, these issues and sort of a long-term strategy, eventual exit strategy, really from the outset um, and learning from one another. So I hope that today's session has helped contribute to a little bit of that and given you the opportunity to, to hear and learn from, from one another. I want to say a really big thank you to, to all of our speakers for joining today and sharing your experiences. I think it's been a really rich discussion um, and really value your, your time and, and, and your expertise on this. So Thank you so much. I am not even going to try to, to summarize, uh, but we will, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, try to hopefully eventually capture some of these learnings in some type of, of practice note. Um, we had the opportunity earlier this year to also um, have a conversation with all of the national protection cluster, uh, or quite a few of the national protection cluster coordinators on uh, exactly this issue of protection during transition. So we'll draw from, from their learnings as well. Um, and try to, to package that up uh, into something useful that um, that those of you that are having these conversations can, can draw on. Um, I also want to just say a big thank you to my colleague, Elise Retch, who's helped with a lot of the preparations for today. So big thanks to you, Elise. Um, and to all of you who are, who are joining this call and joining other sessions of the Global Protection Forum. Um, and with that, I think we will close here. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day.